Hello, physics students, and welcome to topic four, which is a pretty big um, topic in IB physics. If you're in standard level physics, um, topic four is the only treatment that you'll have of oscillations and waves. If you're in higher level physics, in addition to topic four, you'll be doing topic nine, which is um, exploring these concepts in a little more complexity and depth. So to begin with, um, I'm going to talk about waves, uh, introduce some concepts to you that, well, things that you may or may not know. And um, I'm going to probably just refer to water waves initially because that's the kind of wave that most of you have experience with. Um, and what I'm showing here is this video is from a, a picture of a ship. So we're all familiar with the way that water moves, uh, especially in the ocean, up and down. Um, actually, the way that water moves is quite complicated mathematically and physically, as shown by this sort of classic picture of an ocean wave. All of us have seen waves, and we're familiar with waves in the context of water. And in the most general sense, a wave is any disturbance that travels through a medium or something that carries energy from one place to another, okay? Um, and they can carry energy from one place to another through uh, anything, as it turns out, through solids, liquids, and gases. And in fact, you don't even need to have um, material for it to pass through. For example, waves can, uh, electromagnetic waves can travel through vacuum, the vacuum of space, for example. Okay, um, so these two bottom images show you, uh, just sort of remind you of how much energy can be transferred from one spot to another in waves. If you've ever tried to stand up in the surf or walk through the surf, um, you can get knocked over, um, obviously, by big waves. And of course, in earthquakes, um, the destruction of buildings after an earthquake really shows you how much energy is um, contained in those waves, okay? Another thing about waves is that there's no large-scale net motion of the medium through which the waves travel. And let me show you an example um, to sort of illustrate this. So we've studied energy conservation and energy transformations, for example, between kinetic and gravitational potential and vice versa. There's a boy who's throwing a ball, um, a baseball to a girl, okay? Now clearly energy is carried through the ball, right? <clears throat> and that energy comes initially from the, um, from the chemical potential energy inside, inside the boy, basically from what he had for breakfast or the food that he, that he had eaten in order to actually impart kinetic energy to the ball. Kinetic energy is transformed into gravitational potential, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, both energy and matter are transferred. So the boy actually gives the girl the material, the actual atoms and molecules in the baseball, and she catches it, okay? This is very different than, uh, than a wave, okay? So if you consider a case where there's, this, there's a taut string between the boy and the girl, and the boy sends a wave, um, one wave pulse down towards the girl, Again, energy travels from the boy to the girl, but only energy is transferred. The actual matter of the rope is not transferred. Now, I should point out that the rope does move, right? In this case, it moves perpendicularly to the velocity of the wave pulse, but it's not the case that the girl receives the whole rope, like kind of being thrown to her by the boy, right? But she definitely feels energy. So there's a subtle, maybe not so subtle difference between these two cases. In fact, we can define a wave as any transfer of energy without an accompanying transfer of matter. That's called, that's what a wave is, okay? And waves can obviously cause cause what we call oscillations or vibrations, which exhibit simple harmonic motion, and they're periodic, meaning we can consider these oscillations and waves in terms of frequency, uh, wavelength, and period, and we can also talk about their velocity. And you need no more proof of the oscillations of water waves than if you're uh, in a boat going up and down, and if you're prone to seasickness, I recommend that you don't watch this video for too long, okay? But oscillations, you see this? So the camera, which is affixed on the boat, is going up, and down, up and down in a fairly regular periodic fashion, okay? All right, I just want to reiterate um, a couple of definitions, defining terms of waves for you. We've gone over this before, okay? Amplitude of a wave is the maximum displacement of the particle in the wave from the equilibrium or mean position, uh, and it's called A, and A in this particular diagram would be <clears throat> this distance from here to here. Don't make the common mistake that it's from crest to trough. It's not. It's from crest to the middle or from trough to the middle or equilibrium position. 
the wavelength is the horizontal length of one cycle of the wave, okay? And I want to point out here very early on the difference between a displacement time and a displacement position graph for waves. The wavelength only makes sense when you're talking the horizontal distance on a displacement position graph, okay? Because wavelength has the dimensions of length, which are in SI units or meters. The period, on the other hand, <clears throat> is... You can think of it as kind of like the wavelength on a displacement time graph. It's the distance between successive um, peaks or troughs, but on a displacement time graph. And the period, as you know, is the time taken from one complete oscillation. Okay, And the period is related to the frequency because the period is the inverse of the frequency. Okay, And vice versa, frequency is the inverse of the period. And the frequency is simply the number of oscillations that take place in one second. Okay, We've talked about frequency a bit. For example, the frequency of your birthday is once per year. Okay, Turns out that the units, the SI units of frequency, are per second. Okay, waves per second, but this is such a common thing that we use is, uh, that we call it, that's got its own unit called the Hertz, abbreviated capital H little z. Okay, all right, so let's try an example, uh, kind of wrapping up all the things we've talked about so far in this video. Pause the video and try this one on your own. It's a past paper question. Okay, so we have a wave traveling along the surface of shallow water, of shallow water in the x direction. We're being given a displacement time graph here. Okay, that's very important. The first thing you should do when you work problems like this is to notice what kind of graph that you have. Okay, this is a displacement time graph, which means that uh, the measurement between a successive peaks in the horizontal, it's not the wavelength, it's going to be the period. Okay, use the graph to determine for the wave, the period, the frequency, the amplitude, and the speed of the wave, okay? So the period, all you need to do is read the graph. Uh, looks to me like it's about 0.133 seconds. Notice how, uh, notice what each division stands for here, okay, on the x-axis. This is a very typical IB um, past paper graph where maybe the number of um, Seconds represented by each block is not entirely straightforward, so you'll need to figure that out. Okay, the frequency, which is one over the period, is about seven and a half hertz. Okay, the amplitude, simply you just read it from the graph. Okay, it's from it's from the equilibrium position here all the way up to one peak or um, trough. That's about eight. That's exactly eight millimeters, actually. The speed of the wave is 15 centimeters per second. What's the wavelength? Okay, well if it takes 0.133 seconds for one wavelength to pass and the speed is 15 centimeters per second, then we can express speed as wavelength per, over the period. Okay, And in fact, this is a sort of a rudimentary form of what's called the wave equation. All you do is you solve for the wavelength, and I get that it's what, about uh, about about 20 millimeters, or about two, uh, about two centimeters. Okay? Okay, I wanted to find something else that's very important in physics, and that's called the, the phase difference. Some of you might recall this, okay? The phase difference, which is given by the Greek letter phi, uh, is the distance between identical points on two different waves as measured on the x-axis. So in this case, I have a blue wave and a red wave, both of which have the same wavelength, which, are, which is, in this case, eight units being eight boxes, okay? What I've done here is I've labeled in radians uh, the position along the x-axis. Okay, remember one complete um, one complete period or one complete time around a circle or one complete wavelength gives me two pi radians. Half is pi, half of that pi over two, and so forth. Okay. Now these two waves are at, are out of phase, and the phase difference is 1.5 units. Okay, and you can see that very easily because this distance right here between, in this case, it's easiest just to look at two two crests is 1.5 units. Or in other words, more generally, we would say that the phase difference is pi over 2, about, uh, well, I guess it's about pi over 2, right? Okay? All right. Now, in this case, these uh, the two waves are completely out of phase or perfectly out of phase. So the phase difference is 4 units, which is a half of a wavelength, as you see. Or more correctly, um, phi, uh, phi equals pi. Okay? Now, in this case, uh, now, in this little video, what I'm doing is I'm moving the red wave over towards the blue wave. And guess what it's called when, when they both completely line up on top of each other? That's right. They're called in phase, and the phase difference is zero units, or more correctly, the phase difference is zero. Okay, so here's another application of, uh, of radians. Um, outside of a context of circular motion um, and in the context of waves. And what you're going to find out very quickly, uh, very shortly, is that uh, there's a very, very intimate relationship between circular motion and waves. Okay? Here's another example. Pretty straightforward. Go ahead and try this one on your own. 
Okay, so we have four sets of graph. It looks graphs. It looks like graph A shows two waves of, of unequal frequency. B would produce no resultant wave, and that's a hint of things to come, the superposition principle, which I'll talk about later. Um, equal wavelength with different phase, B. Two waves of equal amplitude, that would be C. And uh, unequal amplitude, but the same period, that would be D. All right? Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how oscillations are waves. Okay, so oscillate, an oscillation is any um, motion that's repetitive in time around a central or equilibrium value. Because it's repetitive, the motion has a pattern and it's periodic, therefore it has frequency, amplitude, and so forth. And there are lots and lots of things in the universe that are periodic, okay? Mass spring systems, see that? There's a period, it's going up and down regularly. Pendulums, of course. Ocean tides, this is pretty cool, right? Ocean tides go up and down, there's, there's a period, periodicity to them. <clears throat> Predator-prey cycles in biology, geysers, if you've ever been to Old Faithful, it, um, it sort of blows its top at, at a very, very regular interval. Eclipsing binary star systems, which we'll talk about later in this class. Even human heartbeats are obviously periodic. Business cycles, there's tons of oscillations, uh, tons of examples of oscillations, and uh, we're going to consider oscillations to, in this class, essentially be waves, okay? Okay, so case one, just to look at a few of these in a little more detail, a pendulum. If I connect a, pen, uh, a pencil or a pen to the end of a pendulum such that the tip of the pen just writes on a sheet of paper and I pull the sheet of paper horizontally, what it's going to do is it's going to trace out a sine wave, okay? And if you've ever been to, uh, to a museum <clears throat> such as the Academy of Science in San Francisco, that's a good idea, they, uh, a good example. They have an example of what's called the Foucault pendulum. And this is a pendulum that actually, <clears throat> beneath which the Earth actually moves, and what it does is it traces out a particular pattern like this on the floor. It's not the pendulum that's moving, it's the earth that's moving beneath it, okay? Case two, the shadow of a stick placed on a rotating disc, okay? This one is very uh, straightforward, okay? If you have a light up here, you can imagine this. This stick goes rotating around. As it does, the shadow goes back and forth, back and forth in a very similar way as uh, that a pendulum does, okay? <clears throat> Case three, a mass oscillating on a spring vertically. This is one that we'll study a lot in this class, okay? This is a second order differential equation. Don't worry so much about that. But you see, if I graph displacement against time, I get a nice sine wave there, okay? Right? And this, this, uh, this graph here kind of shows you where it is. Equilibrium position at y equals zero. Maximum displacement positive or negative, okay? And a particle oscillates periodic, periodically if it traces out a wave. So you see if I have a fixed particle, like on a string or a rope, what it does as a wave goes through it is it goes up and down. It oscillates regularly with a period, okay? Case four, a ball rolling down in a, in a frictionless circular bowl. That's pretty cool, right? One thing that you notice about all of these oscillations is when these things are going back and forth, Notice how they're going faster as they pass through their equilibrium position, and they slow down and they eventually get to a speed of zero on the edges, okay? And that's a very, very important thing to notice, especially in the next section of the class where we talk about the defining mathematical equations of simple harmonic oscillations. Case five, a block of wood bobbing on a water surface. We've already seen this video where you can imagine that you're a block of wood, hopefully not getting seasick, okay? Um, we talk about masses oscillating on springs horizontally in the case of no friction. So you can see this case. This red arrow um, refers to the restoring force. If you remember Hooke's law that we studied before, it's the restoring force, which is constantly bringing the mass back to its equilibrium position, but then again constantly overshooting it, which is why it moves in the other direction, and which gives rise to its oscillation. Okay, okay. so considering a little close, more closely a mass on a spring, when the mass is attached to the spring, the spring stretches until the equilibrium position is reached. If the spring is pushed up a further distance, which would be the amplitude of the wave, and then released, the following motion graph would look like this. It would go up and down, up and down. Now, it turns out that this experimenter started the timer, okay, when the, um, when the ball, when this mass was actually going through equilibrium on its way up. You can see that, right, because this is positive displacement here and negative displacement here. If you look at this graph carefully, you can ascertain the following information. The amplitude is 2 centimeters. 
the period is 60, about 60 milliseconds, and it looks like a little bit more, and the frequency is about 0.17 hertz. And the spring was initially pushed up two centimeters from the equilibrium, and the stopwatch, or the timer, was started as the spring was going upwards through its equilibrium position.